Two great events in my lifetime have shaped the contours of the present world. One was the rise and fall of fascism. The other is the rise and fall of communism. It was an inferior system that couldn't feed them, that couldn't give them the comforts of life, that was backward in every way, just good propaganda. They kept that up for a long time. The myth of a glorious China. I lived through that. I had to put up with it. I had to fight them because I didn't believe it. Now, what next? Frankly, nobody knows. A new global balance has to be found because there could be very different challenges and different problems. Internally, things couldn't be better. The GIC, for instance, Government Investment Corporation, already has plans. We believe these countries are going to grow and we are going to invest in the stock market. Definitely in Malaysia. Perhaps when the market goes down further, we'll buy more. <laughs> because we think it's going to go up. <laughs> Eventually, when the crisis in the Gulf is over. The other problem that we face is emigration. I raised it last, last year. 88 was the biggest one. We had a net loss of 2009. Why did they leave in that large numbers in 88? Because the economy went down, so they left. <laughs> <coughs> that means the moment we make slow growth, <laughs> that's right. since I'm going to have slow growth in Singapore, I might as well have slow growth in Australia. So many leave, right? But you see how many renounce? Very few renounce. So they have been keeping their Singapore citizenship. <laughs> because the Singapore woman is not so stupid. She knows that white men marry you freely. They also divorce you freely. <laughs> Our graduates, women, are marrying mostly Caucasians. And I believe we cannot leave it as it is. We are going to lose a trained woman graduate and we also lose the husband who's going to be a plus. So if they are highly trained, I say, give them the PR. After two, three years, they can adjust. They want to take citizenship, let them. Then the children will become citizens. You know, there are innate prejudices. And I do not pretend that I don't share those prejudices. I do. I mean. If one of my sons had come back and says, oh, I've got a young lady whom I've met in America, and I said, my first question is, what color is she? <laughs> now, this, these are extremely difficult problems. But we got to face up to the problem and not dodge it. We have to desensitize questions of race, language, questions of culture, so that we can talk to each other in a calm, rational way. There's no use. It's futile kidding ourselves. These are important things. But at the end of the day, remember, if a thing is going to get better, if you leave it alone, then leave it. Maybe it'll get better. But if you know it's going to get worse, it's totally irresponsible to leave it. The recognition that there is a problem is the beginning of a solution. Another issue that which was also very sensitive, and I give credit to Go Chok Tong for having the gumption to tackle it, to reverse our population policy. Yes, people grumble. Why are we changing policy? Because circumstances have changed and a continuation of the policy will be criminal neglect. We need a government which is both bold and prudent. And I am dead serious when I said on the eve of National Day, get our ablest and our best into politics. One key requirement is let's avoid hypocrisy and let's do this thing honestly approximate the market rate try and get the government on the cheap you end up with a cheap government and you'll be sorry for yourselves what does the government have to do to keep up the enthusiasm because somebody else has started something new and you've got to chase him I think that 
sums up Singapore's position. That's the art of government. First job of a government is to equalize opportunities, right? Not equalize results. You equalize results, you're done for. You end up with what Deng Xiaoping calls the iron rice bowl. Nobody works, everybody does his minimum, very little rice in the bowl. Those who are faint-hearted, well, that's the exit for you. It will always be an open country. You can move in, you can move out. There is no other way in which we can live. What made the difference in Singapore was that a group of men in 1963, 64, 65, when we were in Malaysia, we decided that we are going to live only one life. If we have to die, we will die for a cause. That made Singapore possible. We couldn't be placated and settle for less. To settle personally for a way out for yourself was easy. I believe we've got a group of men similarly determined. I'm not sure whether in a crisis they got the same tempered steel, but I think quite a few will measure up. The question is to get more. If you believe you're going to get good government, whatever you do, then you're going to risk it all away. You vote in jokers, cranks, weak men, charlatans, with some gift of the gap. You run a very serious risk of losing everything you have. So the final message I give to Singapore is this. Your future really depends on what you make of it. The government can give you that framework, can give expression to the will of a people, but the people must have their will. If you don't have it, there's nothing a government can do.